Hi guys, we're going to talk today about monetary policy. And there's three things that you ought to get from today's talk. First up, you want to know what monetary policy is. So you can hear this term, you're familiar with it. Second up, you're going to want to know the motivation behind this. Right? Why do we use monetary policy? And then third and finally, we want to know how it's done. Right? If the government is to engage in monetary policy, how do they do it? So to begin with, monetary policy just represents changes that you see in a nation's money supply. Right? In the United States, it is up to the Federal Reserve Bank to decide how much money is actually floating around in circulation. And by making changes to that money supply, we can pursue macroeconomic goals, try to help out the economy in some way by either printing more money or taking money out of circulation. So that's what monetary policy is changes to the money supply in pursuit of macroeconomic goals. Right. In terms of why this is done, usually there are two problems uh, that central banks are trying to address when they use monetary policy. Right. The first is that they find that there is a potential lack of spending in the economy. Right. A lack of GDP, in other words, maybe not enough stuff actually being produced. This goes along with unemployment rates being too high, and also goes along with folks having income levels that are relatively low. And so if that's the case, that we find that there's not enough production and we want to sort of stimulate the economy, the appropriate monetary policy response would be uh, expansionary. And so expansionary monetary policy just means that the central bank is putting more money into circulation. And so put more money in, and the hope is that this is going to stimulate aggregate demand get people to start spending more, and as people are spending more, hopefully we're going to see improvements in all those variables I just mentioned a moment ago. The other possible concern that policymakers would have if they're using monetary policy is uh, concern over the price level. Okay? Said another way, uh, you might be worried that inflation is taking place. So if that's the case, policymakers are worried that there's inflation, really unstable prices or something like this, then they want to do the opposite of the money supply. They want to engage in what's known as contractionary monetary policy, and that's describing taking money out of circulation. So just as we saw in the fiscal policy case, you can either try to stimulate aggregate demand with expansionary monetary policy, right, or you can try to reduce aggregate demand, slow down spending with contractionary monetary so those are the two goals that policymakers would have in mind when thinking about monetary policy. On to the last question, which is how do we go about actually changing the money supply? And this is kind of a tricky thing, right? If it were the case that we were just going to print money, I suppose that that's, that's possible, but it's maybe more difficult to figure out how we're going to allocate uh, all that extra money, right? I, for one, would be very happy to do my part and uh, accept any extra money that the Federal Reserve is printing, but of course it doesn't work that way. Right? We need to be able to increase the money supply without directly giving it to any one person and having distributional impacts associated with that. Right? So there's a couple techniques then that the Fed uses to change the money supply. The first is something called open market operations. And with these open market operations, most basically, the Federal Reserve is either buying or selling existing government bonds. Uh, let's first begin with the case where the Fed might buy bonds. If the Fed buys bonds, right, they're going to be making this transaction or having this transaction with private banks. So flowing into the economy as the Fed buys a bond from a bank is going to be money. Right? So the Federal Reserve gives to some private bank uh, some sum of money. And then in exchange for that coming out of the economy is an equivalent value of government bonds. Right? So it's just a, uh, from the private bank's perspective, it's just a reallocation of their assets. Right? They take some bonds that they had, and those go out of the economy into possession of the Federal Reserve. And then coming from the Federal Reserve comes money into uh, the assets of private banks. And so we're just swapping out assets. Significantly, though, as the composition of assets changes for private banks, the money supply rises, right? Whatever money that the Fed gives to a private bank is now in circulation and 
work its way around the economy. So the takeaway is that when the Fed increases the money supply, or wants to increase the money supply, one way to do it is by buying bonds from private banks. In the other case, when the Fed is selling some bonds to private banks, it has just the opposite impact on the money supply. So in this case, you have money flowing out of the economy, going from private banks to the Federal Reserve, and then flowing into the economy bonds that the Federal Reserve had previously held. Right? So with open market operations then, the Federal Reserve selling bonds represents a reduction in the money supply. So that's probably the most notable way that we impact the money supplies through those open market operations. There's a couple other techniques you should know about too. Another one is when the Fed makes changes to the discount rate. The discount rate represents that rate of interest that the Federal Reserve charges to private banks when it lends them money. And so if the Fed raises that interest rate, then private banks borrow less from the Fed and they also pass on higher interest rates to everyone else, right? So all the other interest rates that we see in the economy correlate with that discount rate. So by raising the interest rate, uh, the Fed can limit private banks' ability to make loans, and in doing so, reduce the money supply. So that would be contractionary monetary policy used to fight inflation. Uh, in contrast, if the Fed wants to reduce that rate that they're charging to private banks, right, that correlates with lower interest rates uh, across the economy, and more spending, right? So when the Fed reduces that discount rate, that would be expansionary monetary policy, again, used to stimulate aggregate. So by manipulating that discount rate, which is totally up to the Fed to decide what rate they're gonna charge, we can impact spending in the economy. So that's a second tool of monetary policy, making changes to the discount rate. The third and final monetary policy tool that I'll discuss is when the Fed makes changes to the required reserve ratio. Don't forget that this required reserve ratio is the share of total deposits that private banks have to keep on hand versus uh, loaning out. And so by manipulating that, the Federal Reserve is able to impact the ability of private banks to make loans. Right? Remember the big takeaway from ch uh, the previous chapter is that every time a private bank makes some loan, it serves to increase the money supply, right? So if that required reserve ratio is pushed down, banks, private banks then have a enhanced ability to make loans and the money supply gets pushed up. In contrast, the required reserve ratio is moved up higher and private banks can't make those loans as easily, then we're gonna see the money supply fall. Right? And so by manipulating that required reserve ratio, we then can change the money supply right? insofar as impact private banks' abilities to make loans. So there you have it, guys, the three tools of monetary policy that, uh, to my mind, are the most important ones, open market operations, uh, changes to the discount rate, changes to the required reserve ratio.